Hi everyone, thank you for joining uh, our second online event for this season. We are, uh, my name is Catalina and I belong to Deep Learning Sessions Portugal and we are here today with Daniel Lops, Lops, I'm sorry if my English <laughs> accent. Um, yeah, as usual, you might expect the format of this talk to be 45 minutes to 15 minutes of talk, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A in the end. Please feel free to uh, post any questions that you have for Daniel in the chat, uh, and we will make sure to address those in the talk or in the end. That's enough about the, the bureaucracy. Uh, let's go to the meetup itself. So today we have this very interesting talk that we are very excited uh, to, present, to give it to you. We Danielle is going to tell us a bit more about this technology that's federated learning and how we can use it to uh, predict the next node in action flows, a work that he did jointly with Odd Systems and UNESCO ID during his master thesis. And without further ado, I'll, I'll the, sh the room is yours, Danielle. Um, yeah, and have fun. All right. So, um, thank you, Katerina, for your introduction, and hello, everyone. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to thank Deep Learning Sessions Portugal for inviting me to speak a little bit on the work I did uh, throughout the past year. And I would also like uh, to welcome everyone to this session. My name is Daniel Wapsch, and uh, today we'll be talking about an experimental study on uh, personalized federated learning. This work, uh, as Katerina stated, was done during uh, my master's thesis. And uh, it was done in collaboration with Professor Luis Rodrigues from INESC and uh, Joanat Carni, Filipe Sunsao, and Miguel Lopes from OutSystems. So, uh, firstly, let's uh, look at a bit of an overview of what we'll discuss today. So, uh, we'll start by understanding a bit of the context of all systems, that is, uh, what are action flows uh, and uh, how, uh, what are they used for, and what is the motivation uh, behind uh, federated learning. And uh, next, uh, we will go into federated learning and understand what is this approach and uh, how does it work and what are some of its challenges, uh, such that we can focus on a particular challenge, which is the challenge of uh, personalization. Lastly, uh, we will look into the results of an experimental study where uh, we applied to uh, where we applied some of these. Uh, personalized federated learning algorithms to the context of out systems, where uh, the objective is to develop machine learning models capable of predicting the next node in action flows. So what are action flows and why do we need them? Well, to understand why, uh, we first need to understand our use case, which is the service studio platform developed by out systems. This platform uh, allows users to develop uh, applications without the need to write code. For that, the user simply need to create a flow of actions, uh, which is called an action flow, um, which represents uh, the application logic. Here on the right, we can see a simple ex example of an action flow. Uh, this action flow receives uh, an input string in a given naming convention. In this case, it's either snake case or Pascal case and it splits the string into several tokens. So for that, it uses a switch action, which essentially just chooses which path to execute based on a given condition, in this case, in the naming convention of the input string. Uh, then in the case of uh, an input string in the snake case, it uh, uses a server action to split the string by the underscore character. This server action simply executes logic on the server. Uh, then it assigns the output with an assign action. In the case of um, a Pascal case uh, string, um, we essentially do the same, but in this case, this, uh, the server action simply splits the strings by the capital letter. Otherwise, uh, we raise an exception with a raise exception action. Action flows such as this one can be modeled as graphs where uh, the nodes represent the actions and uh, 
they uh, can have attributes, for example, every node has a kind attribute, which indicates the, the type of action. So for example, if we have a switch action, we would have a node with the kind switch. Uh, the edges represent the flow from action to action. It can also contain attributes. So uh, for example, uh, an edge, uh, an outgoing edge from a switch action will have uh, a, 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 an attribute which indicates the condition of that edge. Our objective is to uh, develop machine learning models capable of predicting the attribute kind of the next node to be added to the action flow, such that uh, we can recommend possible next actions to the user when the user tries to add a new action to the action flow. As an example, uh, as you can see here, when the user tries to add a new action, a set of suggestions are presented. So currently, these predictions are made by models based in graph neural networks, or GNNs for short. Uh, these are uh, models, a type of model that is specialized in interpreting graph structure data. Um, however, uh, to train these models, we need data. And typically, the more data we feed them, the better they perform. One naive way to develop these models would be to, to create a, a model for each one of the clients and have each one of the models trained with only that uh, client data. This would mean, however, that each client would have to have enough data to train its own model, which is not always the case. Another approach, which is the currently used approach by OutSystems, consists in uh, centralizing the data of all the clients and then training a single model uh, with the data of all the clients. However, this approach has two setbacks. So firstly, the model is the same for all the clients, meaning that the, the predictions made by the model are not personalized to uh, each client. Uh, secondly, since the clients need to share their data, this means that uh, they need to share uh, their applications with a central server. And some clients might not want that because this raises some privacy concerns. Here on this table, uh, we can see um, a dichotomy between the performance of uh, local models and the centralized model for two distinct client profiles. So in the case of client A, and by the way, this uh, performance is measured in terms of accuracy, that is the, the percentage of correct predictions over the total prediction. So for client A, we can see a client that's been using the platform for a long time. So it has already developed almost 4,800 uh, uh, action flows, uh, which means that this client has enough data to create its own model specialized to its own use case meaning that in, this, in the case of this client, the local model achieves better performance than the centralized model, which is a more general model. In the case of client B, we have the opposite. So it's a very recent client to the platform. Therefore, it only has a, a created 60 action flows, which means it does not have enough data to create its own local model specialized to its use case. Therefore, the centralized model uh, being more general, it's preferable to use for this client. So what we want to do is to be able to uh, create, create models capable of predicting the next node in action flows such that we can use the data from several clients to train these models. We can personalize the models for each one of the clients. Um, these models do not incur in a drastic loss of performance in comparison to both the local models and the centralized model. And the models ensure the privacy of the client data. How can we do this? Well, that's where federated learning comes in. But what exactly is federated learning? Well, federated learning is a decentralized uh, machine learning approach, which was initially proposed uh, by Google engineers in 2016. In, uh, in this approach, both the training and the data are decentralized. This means that the training occurs directly in the clients, and uh, therefore, the clients do not need to share their data. For that, federated learning leverages a central server, which uh, maintains a global model and coordinates the whole training process, which proceeds in communication rounds. 
Federated averaging or Fed average is the base algorithm. And now we will uh, look at a simplified view of how a communication round proceeds. So firstly, the central server selects a set of clients to participate in that communication round. In this case, three clients were chosen and it sends them the global model parameters. Then each one of the clients calculates a local update to the global model received. This uh, local update uh, is calculated by performing a few uh, local rounds of computation, where in each one, um, a few steps of the stochastic gradient descent or STD algorithm are performed. Uh, this local update represents the changes made to the group model received. Afterwards, uh, the clients send their uh, local update to the server. And lastly, the server collects all of the local updates from the selected clients and aggregates them. This aggregation uh, is uh, made in a weighted fashion, considering the amount of data points of each client's data set, or training data set. Uh, from uh, this aggregation, the server obtains a global update, which can be used to derive the global model to be used in the next round. This procedure occurs during several uh, communication rounds, where in each one, a different set of clients might be chosen, meaning we are able to train with the data from the several different clients, and the clients uh, do not need to share their data, therefore ensuring uh, the data remains private. So throughout the years, federated learning has been applied to several different settings, and these settings can be classified into several, several different categories. We'll now just enumerate some of these uh, categories and their classifications. So starting with how the data is partitioned, we can have horizontal, vertical or hybrid federated learning. So for horizontal federated learning, we have that the data subjects differ from client to client, but the data features are common. For example, if we have two rival sports clubs uh, in Portugal, it is likely that they'll have different supporters, but uh, will store uh, similar information uh, about each one. In the case of federated learning uh, or vertical federated learning, we have the opposite. So the data subjects are common between clients, but the data features differ. This essentially means that uh, the data features for uh, one subject are spread across clients. For example, if we have a bakery and an hospital in the same region of Portugal, it is likely uh, that they'll have the same uh, customers or patients in case of an, of an hospital, um, but will store uh, different, different features about each one. Uh, in the case of hybrid federated learning, so uh, both the data subjects and the data features differ. So if we have a bakery in Portugal and an hospital in Germany, they'll have uh, different customers or patients and we'll store different information about each one. In our case, uh, we consider the data is horizontally partitioned since each client uh, maintains all the information about a single uh, about all direction flows and uh, every client records the same features about each action flow in terms of uh, the communication architecture we can consider uh, a centralized or a decentralized uh, architecture so in a centralized setting we have essentially uh, the, the same setting I explained previously. So we leverage a central server to uh, maintain a global model and coordinate the whole training process. In a decentralized setting, the server is absent. So the clients communicate directly and uh, update the model directly. In our case, we consider a centralized setting where the central server uh, is uh, used to maintain a global model and uh, coordinated training process. In terms of the scale of the federation, we can have a cross silo setting or a cross device setting. So for cross silo settings, uh, the clients are typically organizations or uh, data centers. So this means that the number of clients is reduced, uh, but uh, the computational power is large and the communication are reliable since we're talking about uh, enterprise networks. For a cross device setting, the clients are typically mobile devices. This means that we have a lot of clients, but their computational power is scarce and 
the communications are not always reliable since these clients might be connected to unreliable networks. So in our case, uh, we consider our setting as cross silo where our clients are the servers uh, from the organizations uh, leveraging uh, the OutSystem Service Studio platform. So not that we've looked into uh, several different applications of uh, federated learning or several different settings of federated learning, where can federated learning be applied to? So we have uh, some examples. So uh, for example, smartphones, so uh, Google uh, has applied federated learning to uh, their Google keyboard, so to the next word prediction task, such that when you type on your phone, the screen so shows suggestions of possible next words. Uh, in this case, the smartphones participate directly uh, in the communication rounds. We also have the healthcare example. Uh, since uh, in healthcare, the data is typically highly sensitive and is subject to several uh, privacy regulations. So in this case, we are not able to centralize the data uh, in order to train a machine learning model, which means that we can use federated learning to be able to train a machine learning model while uh, with the data of several dif different uh, hospitals, for example, while ensuring the data remains private. We also have the IoT example, uh, since nowadays, uh, there are several devices collecting data. We have sensors, wearables, smart homes, just to name a few. And uh, some of this data might be sensitive, meaning it cannot be centralized to train a machine learning model. And federated learning might help by allowing uh, to train machine learning models while uh, maintaining the data on the clients. We also have the autonomous vehicles uh, application. So uh, autonomous vehicles need to be uh, or the models used in autonomous vehicles need to be constantly updated with road information, for example. And federated learning might help by uh, constantly updating the models with the new information from uh, several vehicles while maintaining the data private. Um, in the financial fraud use case, uh, it is uh, very uh, similar to the healthcare uh, use case in the sense that financial data is uh, highly sensitive meaning uh, that uh, federated learning can be used to allow machine learning models to be trained while uh, maintaining uh, the data private. Lastly, we have our use case, uh, the industry itself. So in our use case, we are trying to develop a recommendation system while uh, maintaining the action flows, that is the applications of the, client private, of the client's private. Well, a federated learning is not all rainbows, so uh, there are some uh, challenges that uh, have been developed. Um, so just to enumerate a few of them, uh, we have the client heterogeneity challenge, and this uh, challenge is normally associated with uh, cross-device settings, so where uh, we have mobile devices as clients, because this challenge is concerned with uh, the different hardware of each client, meaning we might have uh, phones with uh, a lot of computation power and other phones with very few computation power, meaning that the same amount of data might take a lot longer to be trained. Uh, and we need to take this into consideration uh, during the communication rounds. Also, these clients might be connected to unreliable networks, we need, which need, means we need to take into account the amount of bandwidth we use with our uh, local and global updates. and we also, also need to take into consideration that we might have dropouts. So this all, need, all needs to be accounted for uh, when uh, doing a communication round. We also have some security concerns uh, because we might have uh, a malicious attacker which uh, intends to uh, bias the, the global model. Uh, so to make it uh, behave in a certain way intended by the attacker. Uh, for example, uh, in an image classification task, the attacker might try to make the model classify an image of a cat as a dog. Um, the attacker can do this by, for example, introducing uh, data to the client data set, arbitrary data, data, or by sending arbitrary updates. And we need to be able to detect these updates and to ex exclude them from the aggregation process, or at least uh, reduce their influence. 
We also saw, have some obvious privacy concerns because uh, the main uh, goal of federated learning is to keep the data private. So we need to ensure that it is not possible to uh, infer sensitive information from, uh, from the updates. Uh, because there have been uh, some attacks where it, it is shown that it is possible to infer some properties or even reconstruct a part of the data um, from the, the global and the local updates. Lastly, uh, we have the data heterogeneity challenge. Well, so um, this challenge is con uh, concerns the, the heterogeneity of the data. This means that we have several clients and uh, each client might have a significantly different data from all the other clients. And we need, you need to be, to be able to ensure that the global model is fit to each client's use case. So uh, our focus is precisely in this last uh, challenge. So how can we personalize the global model to each one of the clients? In the literature, uh, there were uh, several techniques mentioned to um, personalize the global model to the clients. We'll only enumerate a few of them. Uh, so we have meta-learning, clustering, multitask learning, and parameter coupling. Uh, now, just looking at each one of them uh, in a simplified manner, uh, for meta-learning, we have that the objective of uh, the clients is to develop a model uh, which can be uh, updated uh, easily to perform well on each client. So the objective is no longer to uh, create a model which works best for every client, but to create an initialization model called the meta model, which can be easily updated to perform well on each one of the clients. And uh, this update consists in a few rounds of uh, fine tuning. Uh, for clustering, we have that uh, the clients are grouped based on the similarity of their updates. So clients uh, with uh, similar updates would be uh, grouped into the same cluster and the single model would be developed for each cluster. The server is uh, responsible for uh, making the aggregations uh, by, um, by each cluster and for managing the clusters, which means we need a uh, extra server logic. For uh, multitask learning, we have that uh, each client develops his own model. Uh, and the server is responsible for updating these models with all the other clients' uh, models, um, considering their relationships. So um, the clients have uh, weighted relationships between each other. Uh, which means that uh, a model of a client might contribute more to the model of uh, another client than all the other clients. So if we have client A, B, and C, uh, if client A and client B have a, a stronger relationship than client A to client C, the model of uh, client uh, B will contribute more to the model of client A than uh, the client C will. So uh, the server needs to update uh, this, the, each client's model and needs to maintain these relationships uh, between the clients. Uh, lastly, we have the parameter decoupling technique. And in this technique, the model is divided in two parts. So we have a global part, which is maintained by the server and is trained collaboratively uh, between all the clients. And uh, we have a local part, which is, uh, maintained by each client solely, and it is specialized to each client's uh, use case. So in our case, we focus precisely on this last technique, the parameter decoupling technique, and now we'll uh, look into it in a bit more detail. So here on the right, uh, we can see an example of a model. And what the parameter decoupling technique does is it splits the model in two parts. So it splits it in the body and the head. So the body or uh, the representation corresponds to the first layers of the model and it is typically bigger than the head and its function uh, is to extract the properties of the data and pass them onto the head. The head or the classifier corresponds to the last layers of the model and uh, the property on the function of the head is to uh, use the properties extracted by the body and 
output a classification. Uh, depending on the, on the algorithm, one of them, uh, either the, the body or representation or the header classifier, uh, is uh, global and shared by all the clients, and uh, the other is local and specialized to each client. So some of the algorithms uh, proposed in the literature based in this technique are uh, LG Fed Average and uh, FedRep. We will now classify each one according to the global part, the local part, and the local training procedure, that is how the model is trained on uh, each client. We also added the Fed Average algorithm for uh, comparison purposes. So uh, in terms of the global part, for the uh, Fed Average algorithm, we have that uh, all of the full model is global. So um, the clients collaborate on the full model, therefore uh, it has no local part, so no personalization in the case of Fed Average. As for the LG Fed Average algorithm, uh, we have that the head is uh, global, which means that the clients try to uh, find um, a classifier that works uh, for all of them. In terms of, uh, of FedRep, uh, we have the opposite. So in this case, uh, the body is, uh, is global, meaning that the clients try to find a common representation to, uh, to their data. In terms of the local part, uh, FedAverage, as I said, has no local part. So uh, no part of the model is personalized. We have a single model for all the clients. Uh, in terms of LG Fed Average, we have that uh, the body is local, meaning that uh, the representation is per, uh, personalized to each client's data, which allows uh, for each client to uh, have uh, their own type of data. For example, one client can have text while the other can have images. Uh, FedRep uh, has the head as local, meaning that the head is personalized to each client and the, um, so in terms of uh, the local training, uh, we have that uh, Fed Average uh, trains the body and the head jointly, uh, represented by these two joint chains. Um, this means that in the same SGD step, both the body and the head are updated. As for uh, the LG Fed Average algorithm, we also have that the training is joint. So again, the body and the head are trained uh, in the same SGD step simultaneously. And lastly, uh, for FedRep, uh, we have that the training is uh, disjoint. This means that in the case of this algorithm, the head is fully trained first using the global body received from the server. And then uh, after the head uh, having been trained, the body is trained uh, with this trained head. This means that this algorithm is uh, more flexible than the remaining two because uh, it allows us to define a different number of rounds to train the body and the head, which is not possible in the previous two algorithms. So um, to find out which uh, one of these algorithms worked the best for our use case, uh, we performed an experimental study where uh, we compare the performance of uh, these algorithms with the performance of uh, local models and the centralized model. We used accuracy as a performance metric uh, since the, the labels on each one of the clients were balanced. Um, these experiments uh, were performed in the AWS cloud uh, using uh, 33 clients, uh, these clients uh, were chosen uh, in a balanced fashion, uh, considering um, the total amount of data points of a total of 881 uh, clients. So uh, in terms of the federated algorithms, we performed uh, 30 communication rounds. And uh, for the local and centralized model, uh, we performed uh, 30 training rounds. For the federated uh, algorithms, uh, the, every client participated in every communication round. So uh, this means that there was no client selection. Uh, we performed one local training round for uh, both the Fed Average algorithm and the LG Fed Average algorithm. Uh, this means that uh, in each uh, communication round, uh, we performed a single pass on uh, each client's training data set. 
uh, we performed last we performed uh, one uh, vocal training round for the head and one followed by one vocal training round for the body in the case of the FedRap algorithm. In the interpretation of the results, we divided the, client, the clients into uh, three types. So we have the small clients, which are those clients with up to uh, 5,300 uh, data points. Uh, this uh, number, 5,300, uh, corresponds to the 25th percentile of the total data points of the 881 clients. Uh, we also have the intermediate clients partition, uh, which are those clients uh, between 5,300 and 31,700 data points, so between the 25th and 75th percentiles. And lastly, we have the, the big clients, which are those clients um, above uh, 31,700 data points, so above the 75th percentile. So uh, for the small clients, we have here uh, the graph with uh, the evolution of the average accuracy for each one of the rounds and each one of the algorithms. And uh, we can see from our results that the centralized model in pink and the uh, Fed average model uh, or algorithm in blue are the ones which achieve the, the best accuracy. So this essentially means that uh, for these clients, Hey, Benny. Sorry, I think we can't hear you anymore. The sound uh, just cut off. Okay, That's can you now. can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah. Right. So, uh, where did I leave? Uh, leave? In, in this uh, part here, where you were concluding that it's preferable. What? Uh, okay. S oh, sorry. You were just you... commenting the blue line and the purple line. The blue line. Okay. So. Um, we could see that they uh, achieved the, the best performance, uh, meaning that uh, for these clients with uh, less data, it is preferable to um, to uh, train collaboratively on the whole model. Uh, so uh, because uh, they are not able to perform an effective uh, personalization. So uh, we can also see that since the Fed average algorithm achieves similar performance to the centralized model, uh, this algorithm might be an interesting uh, alternative to the centralized model as uh, it uh, does not require the data to be shared, uh, therefore in, um, um, ensuring uh, data, pr uh, data privacy. Uh, we can also see that the FedRep uh, algorithm uh, in yellow achieves uh, better performance than uh, the LG uh, Fed average in uh, red, which means that for these clients with less data, uh, it is preferable to personalize the head than the body. And this is because the, the head is, as in our use case, is significantly smaller than the body, meaning uh, it is easier to personalize. For the intermediate clients, we can see here the evolution of the average accuracy for each one of the rounds and algorithms. And uh, from this graph, uh, we can see that uh, the local model and uh, and the local model in uh, green and the LG Fed average model uh, in red are uh, superiors to the remaining algorithms, meaning that uh, for these clients with more data, it starts to be preferable to personalize at least part of the model. Um, we can also see that uh, towards the final rounds of, uh, of training, uh, the LG Fed average algorithm 
starts to be slightly or uh, better than the local model, which might uh, might show us that it might be preferable to personalize the body and keep the head uh, global, because uh, keeping the head global means it is a more general head, which is able to um, classify correctly some of those data points um, which are less specific to the client and more general. In terms of uh, the big clients, in this graph, uh, we can see the evolution of the accuracy for these clients. And this graph um, shows pretty similar results to uh, the intermediate clients, um, where uh, the, the gaps are uh, more uh, expressive. Uh, but in this case, again, the local and LG uh, Fed average model are superior to the remaining algorithms. Um, and this shows that for these clients with a lot more data and therefore a lot more specific, um, the body uh, might be the part uh, of the model that best captures the specificity of the client data. Since uh, the LG Fed average algorithm achieves similar uh, accuracy to uh, the local model, um, and the FedRep uh, algorithm achieves significantly uh, lower accuracy. So summarizing uh, our obtained results, we saw that uh, for uh, the small clients, the best federated algorithm was uh, the Fed average algorithm. And the best models were the ones um, obtained using the Fed average algorithm and the centralized uh, approach. So for these clients, we, you, we could see that uh, they prefer to collaborate on the full model since they have a few data points and thus cannot uh, effectively personalize the model, meaning that collaboration is key. For the intermediate and big clients, uh, the best federated algorithm was LG Fed Average, and the best models were the ones uh, from the LG Fed Average algorithm and the local approach. So for these clients with a lot more data, it started to be preferable to uh, personalize the model to their use case. And we showed that the, it is preferable to personalize the body, thus the body uh, seems to be that part of the model that best captures the specificity of uh, each client's uh, data. So uh, in conclusion, um, federated learning is a decentralized machine learning approach where um, both the training and the data are decentralized and uh, the clients can collaboratively uh, train a model without needing to share uh, their data. Um, we uh, performed an experimental study in order to infer uh, the feasibility of substituting the current uh, centralized approach of out systems for uh, developing uh, models uh, capable of predicting the next node in action floats. Um, by um, personalized federated learning approaches. Uh, from our results, we could see that there was no ideal strategy. So for, uh, and this, uh, the, the preferable strategy depended on uh, the amount of data points of each client. So for uh, clients with uh, less data, they uh, preferred to uh, train the full model uh, collaboratively. So uh, they prefer to train without any personalization. And uh, for clients with uh, more data, since uh, they had a lot more data, they started to prefer to personalize. And we showed that the body seemed to be the, the best uh, part of the model to uh, personalize. Therefore, uh, as future work, um, an approach which is uh, an hybrid approach which is able to combine the Fed average algorithm and the LG Fed average algorithm and uh, is able to um, automatically choose which one to use according to the amount of data points uh, of each client. So for smaller clients, the Fed average and for larger clients, the LG Fed average um, should uh, be developed. And with that, I finish my presentation. Uh, any questions you might have, uh, feel free to ask them. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel, for this great presentation. Uh, guys that are watching, please feel free to leave any, any question you might have, guys and girls, by the way. <laughs> feel free to leave any question that you might have. In the meantime, maybe I can start with uh, uh, one of the questions. 
Um, you mentioned that federated rep or the fed rep technique Same. has to train the local part and the global part. Um, I was wondering if that's done in a single pass. So is it like you first completely train the body, then you freeze those weights, or sorry, you first completely train the head, you freeze the, the weights, and then you completely yes. train the body? Or is it like more interactive in each round? You, you train a bit of no, the head. You completely train the head, and then uh, you train the body. And in the second communication round, does that happen? Is it, again, does it yes. also happen again? Okay. Yes. Um, and so it's, to me, it seems a bit counterintuitive that we would train first the head, since we don't have like a very good notion, like a, a very good notion of the, the, the representations or how the models would represent the data in like this embedded space. Do you have any uh, ideas of why uh, we might be interested in first training the head or the classifier and then only the body? Um, well, honestly, I don't remember exactly uh, why they uh, first trained the head. I remember that uh, their uh, the, the they opted to uh, to do this split training precisely so that they would be able to uh, train the head. Um, for a different amount of runs uh, than the body uh, because they showed that uh, the more you train the head wouldn't influence or um, would not um, affect negatively the performance of the model uh, but i am not completely sure as to why they would uh, train first the head and only then the body i guess if you end up running that for long or a lot of rounds it will eventually it will eventually convert so it won't matter I mean, as much but yeah i think i think it was because they wanted to um have the, the body uh be more adapted to uh the specificity of the data so they would train the head the head would be more personalized and then uh, when you train the body with a more personalized head in theory the body would also be more personalized Um, yeah, thank you for that answer. I also have um, another question. I think at some point you mentioned that one of the federated learning techniques uses keeps the similarity between the data, data sets or the similarity yes. between the... Yeah. Um, have you... Have people tried to couple that in some sense with the parameter decoupling? Because uh, like completely decoupling the for example, some of the parts you might be missing out on some useful information that is for some data sets. So maybe what I'm trying to get at is that has any work tried to combine any of these techniques together? Uh, for example, I see I'm not case. aware of it. Uh, I'm not aware of it, but it would be an interesting approach. I know that there's a very recent uh, parameter decoupling technique that instead of dividing the model in two parts, it divides it in the amount of parts you want, so you basically just decide which parts you want to uh, you want to train uh, collaboratively and uh, which ones you want to maintain locally. Uh, but um, it would be an interesting approach to to also do that and to also maybe have each cluster. Uh, influence each other, depending on relationships as for as it happens in multitask learning. Yeah, thanks for your feedback. Because I was just thinking, seeing your results in the small clients, um, that for example, so just remind me, all these experiments considered all the different clients, but you are just showing the results for the small clients while using the updates for from the large ones as well? Uh, I didn't understand what you meant. Could My you bad. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I, I was trying to, uh, understand or to clarify the, the small clients results yes. that you have here? Are yes. these the result of using the 
updates of the big clients as well? Or so, from the 30 clients you had, you just considered the small ones and then you just run it? No, I just, I just ran, uh, I tested, ran uh, the test data set on uh, the obtained models for each one of the models. And these obtained models were obtained using all of the clients, so the 33 clients. So essentially the models uh, have an influence of all the 33 clients. And uh, I just averaged the, the accuracies of the small clients. Yeah, thank you. I don't know if well, that has answered your question, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, because I initially I thought you were just considering the small clients. The, the updates were just considering the small clients. You could be missing out on some inf useful information. No, no, the, the no, 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 no. The updates are considering all the clients and it's just an average of uh, the, the small clients' accuracies. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat. Uh, Manuel is asking if you have any ideas of how you would merge FedAv average and LG FedAv. Well, that was uh, another part of my master thesis uh, where I tried to uh, merge these two algorithms. Uh, I think I can show you here the this was an attempt, uh, oh no, I cannot show you here, or I can I, let me see. Um, let's see it, in, all right. So this was an attempt we did. So um, for the for the smaller clients, uh, we essentially do the, the same as Fed average. So the client trains the full model uh, jointly and just send back the full mod sends back the full model. And for uh, the large clients, or uh, that is the intermediate and big clients, we needed to keep two models. So uh, the client uh, would uh, receive uh, the full model from the server, so the global body and the global head, and uh, it would maintain a global body, um, a local body, sorry, and it would use the received global body with uh, the received global head, and it would train them uh, normally as if it was performing Fed average, uh, but it would only uh, uh, use the, the global body of uh, this trained model. So to, sorry, uh, this would be basically a replicate in Fed average and it would only use this global body to send back. And it would uh, do a separate training where it would simulate LG Fed average by maintaining a local, uh, a local body and using the, the global head received from the server. And after training, it would send back uh, the global body from the first, uh, algorithm simulating Fed average and the global uh, and the obtained head from uh, the second uh, training um, simulating LG Fed average. But um, in this case, obviously, we, we would have some uh, extra computation on the larger clients. So we also tried to do another approach where we would uh, try to use uh, only a single tr a training pass, uh, but uh, we were not able to do so as uh, we would maintain a local body and we would send this local body instead of this, uh, this body calculated from Fred average. Uh, but this would uh, not give good results because we were essentially sending uh, more and more specialized local bodies in each round, which when aggregating uh, would uh, hinder the performance. Maybe it was a bit confusing, but uh, we, tr we tried and this actually gave good results, but it has that setback of uh, having to calculate two uh, separate uh, trainings for uh, two different models. Yeah, thank you. It's definitely interesting. Uh, and it's a shame that we have those setbacks. Um, we have here another question, this time from Luis. He is asking, um, in the splits you show some layers that are local and others that are global. Do you know any approach where there are some neurons on the same layer that are local and others global, like kind of vertical splits? The same layer? Uh, no, I do not. I do not know of any uh, approach like that. Yeah. 
Did, do you think it would be feasible? Have you ever thought about it? Or no, I actually I actually did not think about it because uh, in our use case it actually made more sense because of the model itself to have uh, this body and head split. So I had never thought of it. Uh, no. I mean, uh, if if it's possible, probably yes, because this is just averaging. So. Yeah, I, I, I think it might have to to have a little bit more engineering to it, maybe because of the connections, yes. how to deal. Then it's not easily parallelizable, perhaps, um, because you won't have this, all the information. But yeah, I guess you have more things that might occur because of the gradients. I don't know. Just thinking out loud here with you. Uh, this also asked, besides the size of the clients, did you study your thought of studying any other factor that might impact the performance of the personalized versus the global model? Uh, yes, uh, we tried to study uh, the learning rate uh, to understand which learning rate uh, worked the best in your use case. We also tried to understand a little bit about uh, how the the uh, local the amount of local rounds influenced each model. Uh, however, um, since these experiments uh, were very costly, uh, at some point in my thesis, I had to opt out to remove some uh, algorithms. And at the time, I actually removed Fedra because I had uh, other algorithms. Um, so uh, I do not know how Fedra was influenced, uh, but uh, yeah, we, we tried that. We also wanted to try the number of clients for a round or selecting a set of clients each round, uh, but we were not able to do that, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah. Uh, Katrin, I'm not hearing you, you're muted. Thank you. I think that's it in terms of the questions. We don't have any other questions in the chat. I think I, one of the last question I could ask you is just what's your, how, how close are we to actually implement some of these federated learning algorithms in settings like well, hospitals or finance, financial? Firm? There are several, several studies on hospitals and finances. Uh, there are also uh, several different frameworks for federated learning. Uh, so I don't think we're that far, honestly. Um, obviously, there are some uh, security concerns and some privacy concerns, and it's a very hot research area at this moment. So uh, more research is being uh, done every every day. Uh, so, but uh, I believe we're um, pretty close to it, to be honest. Uh, but we never know to be sure, honestly. You're muted again. <laughs> yeah, no um, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for giving this very, very good talk. And I personally really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, so for our viewers out there, um, this video will be made available on YouTube and the slides on the Deep Learning Sessions Portugal GitHub. I'll kindly ask you to fill up this feedback form that you're leaving in the comments below because it will help us to bring topics that you guys are more interested in and also to improve for further sessions. And thanks again to Danielle and for everyone for participating. And see you in the next time. Thank you.